It is our pleasure to bring to your home this wonderful event. Springfield, Illinois is the home of this jewel, the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum. This museum may be small in size, but large in exhibits, presentations, and culture. My name is Teresa Jones. I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy and Outreach in the Springfield and surrounding communities. AARP is your trusted friend and fierce defender. We advocate for people 50 plus to live in a society where they can be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. We create age-friendly, livable communities that helps people live where they choose and remain independent for as long as possible. Now mark your calendars for October 1st, which is part two of our conclusion of our museum tour. Now, go get your family, grab your snacks, and sit back and enjoy our first segment of AARP Presents, the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum. I'm Nell Clay, and I'm the current president of the Board of Directors of the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum. And I want to thank you for tuning in to our video. We're located at 1440 Monument Drive here in Springfield, Illinois. And I always tell people when they're coming to visit us, if you're headed into Oak Ridge Cemetery, stop, look to the right, and our building is on the right. And I also want to thank AARP for their sponsorship for this video. So as we move forward, we will have a, a brief history of the museum, then I'm going to provide an overview of each exhibit, and then board members and volunteers will come to provide details of each exhibit we currently have available on display. Hello, my name is Kimberly Moore, and I am a board member here at the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum. I am here to give you a brief history of the museum. The museum was founded in November 2006 by eight individuals who came together to form the Springfield, Illinois African American History Foundation. The foundation began as an oral history project, first person histories in the Springfield area. Led by volunteers, the late Terry Jackson, Cullum Davis, and Katherine Harris. In February 2012, the museum moved to its first building on East Washington Street, establishing its goal to educate residents and visitors about the African American experience in Central Illinois. Some of the most, museum's most memorable exhibits are, of course, its very first exhibit a pictorial history of Springfield African Americans in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s by none other than Winford Doc Helms. If you were lucky to have your picture taken by him, you were probably a pretty famous indeed. One of the museum's greatest accomplishments was the red tail exhibit of the Tuskegee Airmen and the Mustang plane they flew. In August 2018, they also opened the exhibit about the 1908 race riots here in Springfield with a screening of the film Springfield Had No Shame documentary, a book signing for Sundown Town by Douglas King and Kevin Corley, and in October 2018, a reading of, of the speech given by Dr. King here in Springfield to the AFL-CIO on October 7th, 1965. And most recently, the absolutely surreal exhibit of the Middle Passage created by Jim Betts and Alice Borkin. The museum also lets its hair down, dresses up each fall for the, its annual gala fundraiser, honoring individuals and organizations making their own history here in Central Illinois. So our first exhibit I'm going to mention is the Middle Passage. This exhibit is actually a set, is an interactive exhibit with a model slave ship. 
has an awesome picture of Mother Africa crying over her babies being taken into slavery. And every time I think about that, I get very emotional. So this is an awesome exhibit, and I hope you plan on coming to see it. Next to that exhibit is an exhibit on President Barack Obama. We purposely put these exhibits next to each other to emphasize the fact that we went from slavery to the White House, a White House that was built by slaves. This is basically a pictorial exhibit because he's recent in history, and we want you to see what he did, not necessarily read about what he did. Next, you will have an exhibit on the Illinois early African-American families. These are families that have lineage in Springfield since the late 1800s, and they still have family members here contributing to our community. It talks about the obstacles that they had to overcome, the tenacity that they took to get through so many different situations, but they strived and they prospered. So the families that are currently up are the Woodson family, the Merle family, the Schultz family, the Osby family, the Hubbard family, and the Cummings family. Our next exhibit is on Illinois African American First. We're featuring people from Springfield and surrounding areas of Illinois. This exhibit is featuring individuals that are not well known, but through their tenacity, their hard work, their stick to itiveness, they became the first in their area of expertise. And we love this exhibit because when students come to this exhibit, to the museum, to look at this exhibit, they see individuals that went to the same schools they went to, live in the same community that they live in, and we tell them if these individuals can do it and become very successful and make history, then they can as well. Then we also have an exhibit on African-American women on stamps. There were 40 women, including one Latino woman, that were actually featured on U.S. postage stamps. And our featured exhibit is an exhibit entitled The Illinois Freedoms Project. Now this exhibit is on loan to us from the National Park Service. It is a six panel, three-sided, freestanding exhibit. It depicts Illinois history from pre-slavery through Reconstruction, through the Civil Rights Movement. It's interesting, it's informative, and one little tidbit fact about this exhibit that I didn't know until I read it, that one of our former Lieutenant Governors, Pierre Menard, actually owned slaves. So I hope that piqued your interest in watching the rest of the video, and hopefully we will see you at our museum. So I encourage you to Google the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum. Check out our website to see what we're doing in our upcoming events. Hi, I'm Gail Simpson, former alderman, city of Springfield, and current board member of the Central Illinois Springfield African American History Museum. I want to talk to you today about a very important exhibit here at the museum. It's the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage, and actually it is the depiction of the hull of a slave ship that carried individuals that were taken from Africa and brought to the Americas beginning in 1500 and it occurred for over 350 years. These individuals were forced into bondage. They had no choice in the matter. Now, we call it the Middle Passage because there were three legs. They started in Europe, slave traders. They went to Africa, picked up their chattel, and then the middle leg was to the Americas. And from the Americas, 
back to Europe. Individuals were shackled together, as is depicted in this picture. They were shackled together in an area five feet by two inches. Many were not allowed to move. Men were separated from women and unfortunately, women were raped and many delivered children from their captives once they arrived in the, the Americas. The information here with regard to this exhibit is very extensive. Now we see from this rendition, the actual slave ship and how these Africans were all put together with very little room to move. They were shackled, as you can see. Many did not survive the trip. Disease, suicide were several reasons why they did not survive. 11 million, 11 million individual Africans were transported across the oceans. 9.6 million ended up in the Americas. The very first slave was brought to the Americas at 1619. That's when slavery in America began. Some people will say they will try to justify slavery by passages in the Bible. But let me be clear. Slavery is against everything that God intended. When you see the depiction of these slaves in the hulls of these ships, it should give you pause. No human being should ever have been subjected to the treatment that they received. It is, in my estimation, interesting that this exhibit is the first exhibit that you see when you come into the museum. There's probably a good reason for that. Because with, with the Middle Passage, we see the beginning of slavery in America. I hope that you will come and see this exhibit. I hope that you will feel something when you see this exhibit and understand that the Middle Passage was the beginning, but it was not the end of black people's success in America. We wanna thank our exhibit designers and our sponsors, Rotary Club of Springfield, Springfield Area Arts Council, and Lincoln Land Community College. We also want to thank Mr. Jim Betts, who designed and constructed the exhibit, Ms. Alice Boykin, designed and constructed the slave figures, Corbin Cass King, the artist presentation of Mother Africa, which you'll see inside the exhibit, and the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum for their technical support. And please be mindful that the images that you see are from Tom Filling's book, The Middle Passage, which coincidentally we have here at the museum for purchase. American History Museum opened the Obama exhibit in January 2019 to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the inauguration of the first 
African-American president. Barack Obama, the 44th president, started his political career in Illinois, right here in Springfield, as a state senator from 1997 to 2004, then on to Washington as U.S. Senator from Illinois from 2005 to 2008. He announced his candidacy for president right here in Springfield on the old state capitol steps. This was very important uh, location for his announcement because it was the site of Abraham Lincoln's speech which he delivered on the House Divided in 1858. He won the 2008 election. He was inaugurated President of the United States on January 20th, 2009. This exhibit here at the African American History Museum chronicles the presidency and the ascendancy of Barack Obama but we wanted to do it in a little bit of a different light, to look at it from a personal point of view and the relationship and the, the flavor of his presidency. We also wanted to highlight his relationship with Michelle Obama and her very important role in being the first lady of the United States. The first panel that we have shows their ascendancy and their glamour that they brought to the White House and the charm and the endearing aspect of their of the presidency. We have them as various social engagements. They were very well recognized throughout the world. We have Obama and all of his civic things that he did, including here he's working on Habitat for Humanity outfits. We have them at glamorous uh, occasions. Also, when we go into the middle of this panel, we want our visitors to look at the range of his presidency from his um, winning of the election in 2008, all the way through all the various things that happened during his time in office, all the way to 2016. When we go into um, the next phase of this panel, we talk about really looking at the, ver the personality of the president. We look at how he thought through various things that he was involved in doing. And we have several quotes from him as he is working through various aspects and things that he did as a president. In our last panel here, we look at the end of his presidency as they are leaving the White House how he pledged to be involved and to continue civic duty. We have Michelle and what she stood for as, she, as they both exit the White House. So we want our visitors, uh, as they're visiting this particular uh, exhibit on Obama, to really get an intimate understanding of what he brought and the flavor and his personality and Michelle Obama's personality as they came to the White House. We also have in the museum some artifacts that um, definitely captured the excitement of his election to presidency and actually the beginning of his time as president. The museum opened the Obama exhibit in 2019 and it was um, kicked off with the 10th anniversary ball where we celebrated the inauguration of Obama, which marked his 10th anniversary. And this is a flyer from that event. Here are several um, commendations we received from, um, from Senator Cammie Duckworth and Kwame Raul, our Attorney General, who were personal friends of Obama. We started to, in looking at everything that started his rise to the presidency, of course, uh, we have some signed copy, copies of The Audacity of Hope, Dreams of My Father, which many people reviewed, and several pieces from his uh, campaign, such as Vote for Change, Obama 08. 
We also move as we go through this case to look at some buttons that we really wanted to highlight. What's so cool about the buttons that we show is that the sections and all of the Americans in various organizations that supported Obama's presidency. So this collection of buttons we have found are very, very interesting to our visitors. In the case, we have everything from their um, picture showing them at the inauguration, the invitation for the inauguration, several memorabilia pieces. We have uh, Joe Biden as he was coming into being the vice president, and also an actual invitation to the ball itself. So um, if you go further into the case, we have actual pictures of the family, because again, our goal in our uh, presentation of Obama was the personal and the personality of him, his family, and how they affected the presidency. The last case talks about all of the periodicals and the publicity of him being president. This exhibit, um, while it has been here for one year, is one of our most popular ones because me hear many of our visitors saying, I remember when that happened, I remember when this was there. And it's very interesting because it's current history. And they always want to remember the ascendancy of Barack Obama, the first African-American president. Hello, my name is Mary Helen Yoakum. I'm a volunteer with the African American Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Today I wanted to present to you our pioneers in Illinois. We have different families. We have the Murrow family, Woodson's family, and the Neal family on this side. Now the Murrow family came from Kentucky. They moved into the Springfield area and started businesses. At one time, their ancestors were also in the war. A lot of African Americans were in the World War I and World War II. And they were very patriotic because they were trying to let people know, after coming out of slavery, that they were just as patriotic as other Americans. We have the Woodson family, who's very prominent in the area of Springfield. They're in a lot of organizations, and they help the community to thrive towards a better future. The Neal family, William Neal, with his wife, Margaret, came into Springfield area. We have a very prominent member of the Neal family who passed last year, that's Reverend Peggy Senor. Now, Reverend Peggy Senor was the youngest daughter of George and Virginia Neal. She married Clarence Senor, who was a firefighter in Springfield. We have the Schultz family. Charlotte Johnson still lives in Alton, Illinois. Her father was Dr. Kennebrew, and he established a hospital in Jacksonville, Illinois. We have the Osby family. The Osby family moved to Shipman, Illinois. And in Shipman, Illinois, they had a farm, had a few children that were brought up on that farm. Once the children started growing up, they moved to Springfield, Illinois and established businesses. They were into real estate and their family home is still standing on Elliott Street in Springfield. Now at one time, Virgie Smith Olsby had four sons in the military. She was also very active in raising money for the veterans of the Spanish-American War. Not only did she raise money to establish uh, funds for the colored troops, she also included the white troops with that um, fundraising effort. The Hubbard family were born in Kentucky and the matriarch for the Hubbard family 
was Mariah Douglas Hubbard. And in the 1830s, she was a free woman of color. She actually purchased her husband from slavery. And they raised their children as free coloreds in Kentucky. Now, most of her children migrated to Springfield and they established farms in Springfield. And they are also buried in the colored section of Oak Ridge Cemetery. The Cummings family has been in the Springfield area for quite a long time. And they are also in Springfield and Decatur. Once this African-American early pioneers was established, I think it was very important for the community because of the fact that most of Springfield residents did not realize how long African-Americans had been living in the community. So it was very important to establish this exhibit so we could let African-Americans and other people in the community of Springfield know that people of color had been working to establish family and residence in Illinois. Nell Clay, back with you again um, to talk about our exhibit about African American first from Illinois. This exhibit it's, is much more than information about African Americans that were the first to accomplish in their prospective areas. It is about debunking the racist theory that African Americans were not intelligent. The first individual in this exhibit I'm going to discuss is Augusta Tolan. Augustus Tolan actually was a slave. His mother escaped from slavery with he and his four siblings when the Civil War began. He and his siblings were ridiculed when they were put in school because they could not read or they could not write. But eventually they overcame that challenge. And Augustus excelled in school. And along the way he decided he wanted to be a priest. And when he was ready to apply to seminary school, he applied to every seminary school in the U.S. and no American seminary school would accept him because of the color of his skin. Eventually he was accepted in a school in Rome, Italy. After he finished his education, he returned to Quincy as a priest. He worked in Quincy as well as in Chicago, Illinois. On June 12, 2019, Pope Francis, the head of the Catholic Church and sovereign of the Vatican City State, declared that Father Augustus Tolan of Quincy, Illinois, the first publicly recognized American Catholic priest of African descent and a former slave venerable. Such an achievement for a slave that went from slavery to priesthood and possibly a saint. Our next feature is Dr. Alonzo Kennebrew. And you heard a little bit about him for the Schultz family in our family exhibit. Dr. Kennebrew um, went to school and college at McMurray Institute. He worked at hospitals in Springfield. He actually worked at St. John's performing surgery. His specialty was ear, nose, and throat. At some point, the powers that be decided that to create a new qualification to work at St. John's Hospital, you had to become a member of the Sangamon County Medical Society. Dr. Kennebrew applied three times. He was never admitted to the society, never given a reason why he was not admitted. So he said, I'm going back to Jacksonville, and he started his own school. Okay, the next board features Curtis Farrell Clay. Curtis was born and raised in Springfield, went to Springfield High and graduated from Springfield High School. After graduating from Springfield High, he went to Howard University and earned his bachelor's degree in architecture. He returned to Illinois and went to Champaign 
the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana to get his master's degree in architecture. He worked various jobs in Chicago. Um, he eventually moved back to D.C. and he was an adjunct professor at Howard University. He was blessed to obtain a job with the government of Washington, D.C., where he was in charge of a design team. One of the major projects that Curtis worked on as head of the design team was the remodeling and redesign of the Eastern Market, which was destroyed by fire. The other thing that he did, he was on the design team that helped to redesign and construct Blue High School in Washington, D.C. In October 2019, Curtis was selected to become the Director of Architecture for the State Department of Building Overseas Operation, becoming the first African American to hold that position. In Curtis Clay's current position, he is responsible for a $20 billion budget which covers the design and maintenance of consulates and embassies throughout the world. And of course, his lovely family. Next we have Dr. Carla Diane Hayden. Dr. Hayden was appointed as the Librarian of Congress, the 14th Librarian of Congress by President Obama. She is the first African American and the first female to hold that position. Anthony Tony Goldsby, he is also from Springfield, Illinois, graduated from Springfield High, and Tony completed a Bachelor of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame in U.S., and then went on to complete his Master's of Architecture at Yale University as he was working as a technical assistant in planning and development. After a period of travel throughout the, the Middle East, Anthony landed in New England. He did projects in Westchester as well as Wales. He currently resides in England. Moving on, we have two individuals on this board, Virgil Doherty. Virgil Doherty and his family ran OK Taxi Cab Company. This was the first cab company in Springfield, Illinois. After World War II, he and his brothers returned to Springfield and they started their cab company where they had a fleet of 30 cabs. We've been told that this was the cleanest, the nicest, uh, and the best looking cabs in Springfield at that time with the nicest drivers. Sharing the board with Virgil Doherty is Felicia Hurst Burton. Felicia is a trailblazer of first. She is from Springfield. She's the first in her family to receive her bachelor's degree. She took a position in Minneapolis, Minnesota with the 3M company as an architect. She was the first to hold the, the position as a, a design consultant for that company. When she returned to Springfield, she took a position with the Capital Development Board as a sole accessibility subject expert at CDB and the chief interpreter of the Illinois Accessibility Code. Felicia is the first African American and the first woman to hold that position. She currently works in that position. Dr. Percy was an African American research chemist and a pioneer in the chemical synthesis of medical drugs with plants. He was the first to synthesize the natural product and a pioneer in the industrial large scale chemical synthesis of the human hormones, progesterone and testosterone from plant steroids. His work laid the foundation for the drug which created birth controls. So we knew that with this exhibit on African American first from Illinois, we could not feature everyone but we did want to feature some people we think you may have heard of to highlight their accomplishments. First is Sarah Good, the first African American woman to receive a patent in the U.S. and she received it for her cabinet bid. Frank Mitchell, at the age of 14, Frank became the first page for the Illinois House of Representatives. Jesse White, I'm sure you guys know if you're from Illinois, he's the first African-American Secretary of State and the longest reigning Secretary of State for the state of Illinois. Oscar Stanton Dupree. Oscar was actually the first African-American to be elected to Congress in the 20th century. 
Most recently in 2019, Lauren Underwood, she became the first African American to win the representative congressional seat for the 14th district in Illinois. I'm sure you heard of Jackie Joyner Kersey. She was the first African American to earn a gold medal in the long jump. Andre Eagle Dollar, we just had to mention him because he's from Springfield, our famous basketball player, pro player, MVP, as well as gold medal winner. Our current Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton, she's the first African American to serve as Lieutenant Governor in Illinois, and she began that position in 2019. And last, but certainly not least, LaShonda Finch. She's the first African American to serve as Director of Oak Ridge Cemetery here in Springfield, Illinois. We think this exhibit is very important. It highlights the accomplishments of individuals that are from this area. So as young people come to visit the exhibit, we just want to show them that you can accomplish the people that walk the same halls and the same schools that you did, worked hard and achieved great things. And we encourage you to work hard and do the same thing. Hello, my name is Katherine Harris, and I'm a board member here at the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum. I'm going to be talking about our exhibit that we mounted back in March to honor Women's History Month. And uh, we would invite all of you to come and see it. And it is a, a collection of commemorative stamps featuring women. I must say there is one stamp in here that features a man on the stamp. However, he's with two very significant women. Our exhibit here features women. So I'm just going to go through the exhibit that we have here and highlight a few of my favorite women. First of all, uh, you have to have been deceased a minimum of five years before you can even be considered and there is called a postage stamp citizens advisory board committee that makes the decision as to who is going to be on a stamp and there's a competition so to speak for artwork uh, that's a part of the process and um, since we started having quote forever stamps uh, all of the stamps that have been issued since that particular uh, event began have been forever stamps. So regardless as to what the current postage price is, these stamps will work forever. So starting here on this panel, for example, my favorite one is Sojourner Truth, who was an abolitionist and she helped to recruit um, soldiers for the Civil War. Zora Neale Hurston is also featured on this panel. Then we have Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells has an Illinois connection because she lived many years in Chicago and with her husband, they started a newspaper. In the awful days of racial tension and unrest, huh, my how things don't seem to change, but she would hang out of her uh, newspaper office window a sign that read, a man was lynched today because she was an avid newspaper woman and an avid civil rights person. Madam C.J. Walker is familiar to many people because of the products that she made to do our hair. On this one, we have uh, Bessie Coleman. She also has an Illinois connection. She was um, from Chicago. However, she had to go to France to learn how to um, fly an airplane because no one in the United States would uh, accept her as a student, so therefore she couldn't get a license. So she went to France instead. But she was very popular because she was also an acrobatic uh, 
pilot. We have on this one Dorothy Height. Dorothy Height might be remembered as being very instrumental in the fight for women's rights and civil rights, and she was a founding member uh, of the uh, National Council of Negro Women, an organization that still exists today. Over here we have, for example, Marian Anderson. I will not try to match her singing voice, which was a beautiful voice. Uh, lots of people will probably remember her and know her story because in uh, 1939, she was not allowed to sing at the Daughters of the American Revolution Hall in Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. And so as a result of that, uh, she sang at Lincoln Memorial at the request of Eleanor Roosevelt. Mary McLeod Bethune was an educator. Uh, Bethune-Cookman College in Florida is named for her and that's a HBCU that continues to exist today. This is one of the stamps that features a man. The person being, being recognized is Fannie Lou Hamer, and she and Medgar Evers were both uh, very instrumental in uh, voting rights and civil rights activism in Mississippi in the 1960s. The Poet Laureate of the State of Illinois uh, Gwendolyn Brooks is featured on a forever stamp. The very first uh, in this series of black heritage stamps that we have was one issued uh, that issued to commemorate my shero, Harriet Tubman, uh, known for her work on the Underground Railroad and for the abolition of slavery. There are lots of singers featured throughout the exhibit. One of my favorites is Ella Fitzgerald, who was known for the, her ability to scat during the period when jazz was really at, in its heyday. Patricia Roberts Harris has a connection also to Illinois, because uh, she was an Illinois native, but she became um, the first African-American woman appointed to a U.S. ambassadorship. And she was also the HUD secretary under President Jimmy Carter. Maya Angelou, of course, we all know who she is, the woman with the voice to me. It, if God could speak as a woman, I think it would be Maya because her voice is just incredible. She was an author, a poet, a biographer. One thing a lot of people may not know about her is that she also was a streetcar operator in uh, San Francisco. But she was a marvelous woman and a beautiful voice. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings is perhaps her most famous uh, biographical account. But then, And Still I Rise is a, uh, one of my favorite poems that she uh, that she wrote. Shirley Chisholm is featured on this panel and she was the first black woman to be elected to Congress in 1968. Her uh, autobiography, Unbought and Unbossed, spoke of her uh, commitment to public service and to civil rights. Shirley Chisholm paved the way for folks like Kamala Harris today to be in, in our Congress. And so when Kamala was making her remarks recently on being the nominee for the uh, 2020 election with uh, Vice President to Joseph Biden, she referenced uh, Shirley Chisholm in her opening acceptance speech. And finally, we have Rosetta Thorpe who was one of the first gospel singers who moved from the church into, quote, the world, into secular clubs. But she did do a lot for the story of gospel music in the United States. I do encourage you all to come and see not only this exhibit, this exhibit, but other exhibits that are here in the museum. And um, thank you for watching.
Hi, my name is June Chappelle, and I'm coming to you from the African American History Museum, where I'm also a board member here. And if, today I'll be telling you a little bit about the Illinois Freedom Project exhibit. Here we have our first panel, which is called the Fight for Freedom. Uh, every 4th of July in the city of Kaskaskia since the year 1778, uh, the residents of the city have rung the Liberty Bell of the West. And this is to commemorate liberation in the territory that will soon become the state of Illinois. As you can see from looking at the panel, the fight for freedom in the state of Illinois, which was supposed to be a free state, but of course we know now that it was not necessarily so. Uh, the fight for freedom would go from 1719, from the inception of slavery in the state of Illinois until 1865. Though Illinois was known as a free state due to quasi-legal slavery, around the year 1820 there was a law put into place that would allow white residents in the state of Illinois to hold enslaved people in bondage in one form or another, one of those forms being indentured servitude until the year of 1865. Here we have panel number three, a vision for something better. This panel gives you a very brief history of Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. He was the son of a French diplomat. Du Sable was born in Saint Mark, Saint Domingue, which is today present day Haiti, around 1745. And he made his way into what would become the US territory into New Orleans around 1765. He was around 19 years old, right before his 20th birthday. He eventually made his way up into the Peoria area. And from there, he made his way into the Chicago area where he was the first non-indigenous resident to ever settle there. In 1778, he made his way to Cahokia with the daughter of a Potawatomi chief given the name of Catherine. They were married there and eventually raised two children together here in Illinois before eventually settling in the Missouri area. To my left, you'll see a bus that sits at the DuSable Harbor of Jean-Baptiste DuSable. Here we have panel number four, Boats Count. One early migrant to the state of Illinois was Edward Coles. He was born into a very large Virginia slave-holding family, but after his father passed away and bequeathed all of his property, including the African-American people that he owned, to his son, around 1819, while on his way into the state of Illinois, he set the enslaved people that he owned free and helped get them a jump start at life. He eventually settled in this area that would eventually be named for him, Edwardsville. Around 1822, he was voted governor of Illinois. And while a politician in the state of Illinois, he also worked alongside the likes of Shadrach Bond and the first lieutenant governor, Pierre Menard. Here we have the panel Stand Against Intimidation. Though chattel slavery was now over by the early 1900s, a lot of African Americans were still under the restraints of racism and the violences that came with it. Around 1908 in the city of Springfield, American residents of the city found themselves under fire by the white residents of the area. And a lot of Illinois residents who were black found themselves still under fire and under racial discrimination and a few found themselves in a position to speak out on this discrimination and the violences that came with it. One person in particular would be Ida B. Wells, an activist, a sociologist, and feminist in her own right. Around 1908, African-American residents of Springfield, Illinois, specifically found themselves under fire when a lie was told by Mabel Trees Hallam, who at the time was having an affair and when it was found out, she lied and said that she had actually been assaulted by a black man in town. The man that she blamed was a local resident and construction worker by the name of George Richardson. And due to this ordeal, the Springfield race riot came to be. Within this riot, three men were slain. One by the name of Scott Burton, a local barber. Another by the name of William Donegan, who was a local business owner, property owner, and former abolitionist and another a young man by the name of Joe James, who was an 18-year-old who had been sent to the Springfield area by his mother at the age of 18 years old. Once again, my name is June, and this is the Illinois Freedom Project exhibit. It's important to the area and also outside of the area to let people know the truths about black life in the state of Illinois. We do hope that you'll come out and see this exhibit for yourself.